So many friends meet, friends who only meet sometimes, perhaps for once every two years. And I can see somebody there who's met a lot of his old friends, Mr. Johnny Price. Mr. Price, would you come over, please? He's the very hard-working chairman of the London Welsh Rugby Club, and I happen to know this. I'm told that you're the man that really drives them, Mr. Price. Oh, I wouldn't say that entirely. We have a general secretary and a lot of many, many helpers in this club. Oh, now, you came uh, originally from Llanurtid Well. That's right, yes. But, of course, the club started long before you came to London. Oh, a very long time indeed. In 1885, in fact. Uh, the originator was Dr. Price Jenkins, who at that time, I believe, was a medical student in London. And uh, he started it from a body of medical students who well, the hospitals weren't playing at that time. And uh, the club originated around a band of medical students. And it developed very rapidly before the turn of the century. And even such famous names as Rhys Gabe, 
Percy Bush and so on were members. In fact, Rhys Gabe was a very famous member of the club at that mm. time. During the First World War, we had a ground at Wandsworth. Uh, our own ground at that time, we owned it, but unfortunately it was sold by the trustees during the war, and at the end of the war we were again left without a ground. We moved, I think this is about the fifth or sixth time we moved grounds, uh, in 1922 to Herne Hill, where we remained until, 1930, uh, until 1957, mm. when we moved here. And that's a move, I take it, that you haven't regretted? Not at all, no. It's been a turn in the fortunes of the club, and I don't think we're ever likely to look back since that day. Um, we found that there wasn't a great rugby support in the southeast of London. We knew that most Welshmen lived in the west of London. That's interesting, yes. And uh, we'd made a very careful census of this, in fact, and we had tried experiments in various games. We'd played Swansea at the Richmond Athletic Ground, we'd played the Wasps, and we'd had quite tremendous gates. Mm. And these really pressed us on to move to the west end of London. Mm. We very nearly got a ground at Hounslow when we discovered that Roslyn Park and the Richmond Cricket Club, or Roslyn Park, were thinking of leaving Richmond Cricket Club, uh, leaving this ground and moving to Roehampton. We stepped in very quickly and after a year, nearly two years negotiations, we moved in here in 19, I believe it's 1957. Yes, yes. marvellous. Yeah. And of course, this gate that you have today on the international match is your best gate of the year, I take it. It is our best gate of the year, yes. And is it uh, your hope that this will continue as a morning of the match fixture? Oh, yes, indeed. We established it, what, six years ago. This is our fourth fixture with Cardiff, I believe, on this ground. Yes. Uh, in the morning of the international match, and we hope now it will be a permanent feature of all our fixtures. And uh, as you see from this morning, it, this, I think, is probably a record gate for us. Many of the large crowd who would call to see Cardiff playing London Welsh on their way to the big game and who remember international football between the wars must surely have recognised one face. That of that great Welsh flyer who played on the wing 12 times and who is now the energetic secretary of the club, oh, Ronnie Booth. I would Boo. say that the London Welsh club at the moment, perhaps its reputation is as high as ever it's been. Mm. We've had some great people working for rugby in London, as you know. But now in the last few years, we seem to have gained a certain elan because of coming to Old Deer Park. And um, the result is that we have perhaps a greater following, many more young men wanting to play with London Welsh, and indeed we're now running six sides. We've got three sort of sides which work very hard towards the first 15, but we also realise we have a service to young men coming to London from Wales to provide for them a good recreational game of rugby football on the Saturday, and therefore we've extended our sides now to, to six. Uh, what would you, your advice be to a young man who may be looking and listening uh, to you now, who's coming to London to live in the near future? Well, I say this to him. It's a grand thing to take a single ticket from Cardiff to Paddington, but it's rather nice to remember home. And if he comes to the London Welsh Club, he'll certainly come into a, a, a lovely Welsh atmosphere, some good lads around him, and I'm quite sure he couldn't do a better thing. In addition to a first-class extra game of football, the exiles at Old Deer Park also include something very attractive and necessary in their international morning menu. They don't forget the inner man, and the amount of eating and drinking is not inconsiderably. Hence, the hard-working ladies of the club here play their part, and not least among them is Mrs. Ellis. Well, really, we're absolutely exhausted. We've been here since about 9 o'clock, cutting sandwiches, and we've sold about... 800 pies, yes. <laughs> and there'll be about 600 hot dogs, and really it's been quite an overwhelming task today altogether. And all these ladies are the ladies of the club? The ladies of the club, and they all give their time uh, to the club, mm. but they're only too pleased to do it, and uh, we're all a very happy band, we work very well together, Good. and uh, we really enjoy it.
on a very special day, not only for the rugby club, but the whole of the London Welsh community. This is the day of days for Welshmen in dispersion, the fulfilment of a hope and a dream of a new clubhouse, which is already the envy of every other rugby club in the metropolis. Uh, the rugby club here has an atmosphere that's unique. It has a warmth and a welcome that you can seldom outstay, created by the rugby people who come to Old Deer Park. Success has come to the club because it's helped itself. People from all walks of life, from all professions, have been seen here shoulder to shoulder, pushing wheelbarrows, mixing cement, scrubbing floors, and making tea. And now, the thrill and pride of this ultimate moment for them, the presence of His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, in accepting our invitation to open officially our new pavilion and stand extension, you have made this the most memorable day in the history of our club and of those others associated with us here at Old Deer Park. In but a brief space of time, you have won the respect and affection of all British people, but particularly the Welsh, because you have so closely identified yourself with our various interests and affairs. In coming, you honour not only this game, which we love so much, not only this club, but Welsh people, wherever they may be. <clears throat> Sir, your presence here today will long be remembered with pride and gratitude. I often read in the press that I have taken a break from my studies at Cambridge in order to attend some function. The picture created is that of a studious undergraduate perspiring gently over several dusty tomes and released periodically from academic chains. Today I've been able to shake loose my fetters in order to open this splendid pavilion. Those hard-working members of the club who have succeeded in raising the money for this improvement need to be very firmly congratulated. Increasingly, it becomes more and more difficult to collect sufficient sums to build new extensions. <clears throat> Almost infallibly, the original estimate proves to be less than the ultimate cost, and this means that a special effort has to be made by the money raisers. Now that the London Welsh Club have this pavilion, more Welshmen from London and from over the border will be able to come and sit in comfort as they watch the club thrash all the English teams. <laughs> yeah. And uh, no doubt, meet their certain Waterloo against a number of Welsh visitors. <laughs> My rugger playing days as a squashed and battered second row forward are now limited, but it is never uninteresting, to say the least, to watch Welshmen play what is almost their game. Bearing in mind that one of my predecessors, Frederick Louis, Prince of Wales, died of an injury received from a tennis ball while playing near this ground, I shall be watching that ball in play like a hawk. <laughs> I also hope that uh, all the players are left on the field at the end. I now declare this pavilion open. Brian Thomas jumping against the big man Jeff Evans and third in the line. That's the jump from Evans. Good ball. 15 yards in from... And the first penalty goal of the match, Colin Gibbons, round the corner kick from 30 yards. <laughs> Billy Raybould. Far too long. Jeff Evans gathers. With him, D Di Bowen and Freddie Williams forming the wedge for this heel.
That's Brian Thomas. Scrum half. Ray Hopkins. Shankton will have to hurry for that one. John Williams is underneath. 20 yards now from the London Welsh line. Penalty to the world side. No trouble at all for Hodgson. So we back where we started. On the back of the tail of the lineout, on the left, Mervyn John of Cardiff in front of him. Stuart Gallagher, that's Delmi Thomas. Good ball. Hopkins to Raybould. Tony Williams. Ian Hall's made the gap into Billy Raybould. A chance now for Skirving. He's got 25 yards to go. Andy Morgan trying to cut him off. Can he get there? A long kick for Graham Hodgson. From the 25. It's low and accurate. This is Stuart Watkins now throwing in 10 yards from the London Welsh line. At the very back, Stuart Gallagher's hand, but Mervyn Davis gets it away. Loose truck, 10 yards out. Thomas tried to find Hopkins. And that's Hopkins inside to Denzel Williams. Always on hand, Denzel Williams was up to take that quick kick from Jarrett in the Irish match the Triple Crown game and there, there he was again on the elbow of his scrum half. Graham Hodgson of Nice, 25 yard line, the ball teed up. Can't miss in this match, Graham Hodgson looking a first class international player. Not many minutes to half time, right on the halfway line. Wales on the left, the London Welsh on the right. Davis to Bob Phillips, John Williams. Tries to put one ahead for Andy Morgan and he's tripped, I think, accidentally by Skirvin. But here's a good run by James, the fullback. Ten yards now from the Welsh line. This is Shanklin and a touchdown there by John Williams. And a John Williams. from here as if John Williams had touched the ball. There was three or four players from either side there, but John Williams, I believe, eventually touched down. The jump is from Evans. Offside, the Welsh backs, and this kick is a pretty straight one for Gibbons if in fact Gibbons is going to take it, which he is. This is Gibbons from just inside the 10 yard line. And it was a good kick. Happy Colin Gibbons in form with the boot. And so on this beautiful ground on the fringe of Kew Gardens in London, the half time score London Welsh, nine points. The Welsh, 15, 13. Colin Gibbons into this line out just inside the 25 yard line in the Welsh half. Deflected by Mervyn Davis. There's Freddie Williams. Inside, well gathered there by Jeff Evans. Good loose heel here would be good. Brian Thomas comes round, kills that ball, is a mile offside. It must be a penalty. An easy three points for Colin Gibbons. This kick can take London Welsh within one point of the Welsh score, and it does. <laughs> Ten or twelve yards now. From 
from the London Welsh line. The deflection there from Stuart Gallagher. This is Norman Gale. Bang. Loose ruck forms. On the blind side, here's a chance. Billy Rabel to Stuart Watkins. Can't get away from Gibbons, though. No, you can't be much nearer the London Welsh line than that. Right on the line. Halfway through this, the second half. And from that scramble, a try has been given to Delmi Thomas. Not very exciting, maybe, but at least it's three points on the board for this Welsh 15. The man carrying the ball, Graham Hodgson, who's moved from full back to scrum half because Ray Hopkins is off the field. 15, Graham Hodgson, with the kick now at goal. accuracy of Graham Hodgson on the 25 yard line London Welsh lying deep for attack Davis to Bob Phillips Bob Phillips to Williams Shanklin into the line Gareth James nasty ball to deal with for John here's fullback James again Hodgson's down under it, Mervyn Davis too, picked up in there beautifully by Mike Roberts. Just reward for effort by the big men of the London Welsh pack. Mike Roberts who's been pushing away in that power position of the scrummage alongside the man with the moustache on his right. Final score then, celebration match. London Welsh 15, and the Welsh 15, 18 points, as His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, leaves the pavilion with Mr. Harold Davis, the President of London Welsh, and Mr. Tom Althwaite, the President of the Richmond Cricket Club, who are the tenants of this ground, through a guard of honour honor formed by the players of both teams and the Welsh guards. On his way back now to his college at the University of Cambridge, having spent a day which will be remembered perhaps not for the quality of rugby, but for the occasion here at Old Deer Park, where the London Welsh Rugby Football Ground has really found a home. Of course, after the match is always one of the important things of rugby football. And here at the new London Welsh Clubhouse, many, many rooms, and the one we're standing in now full of uh, visitors and guests for this match. And I thought that uh, perhaps it's always nice to see how other people look at us, the Welsh. And I couldn't pick on anyone better than Dudley Kemp, this year's president of the English Rugby Union, or the Rugby Union. Thank you. And you paid a great tribute, not only to London Welsh, but uh, the Welsh men in general in your tribute. I did. Yeah. Uh, having had a very wide experience of the Welshman who uh, in every club in England there is a it seems to me there's a Welshman who is one of the driving forces and it is that their attitude which I think helps to make the game what it is. Of course you had experience of playing against all the Barbarians in Wales when they won four times in the, on that the Easter so. Shore. I forgot yeah. what the year it was so yeah. we're at about 1930 or 31 and 32 and then of course the only game I in, in England game I played was against Wales yeah. which was also enjoyable yeah. and uh, my predecessor of Secretary of Hampshire was a Welshman. So you've been surrounded Jones by Welshness, Welshness all your I've rugby been, life? I've been inspired by Welshmen. Can I put it that way? I, well, indeed. And I hope you've been inspired this I, season. I in your, and I wish you a happy year and friends. Thank you very much indeed. Looking, looking forward to beating Wales in due course sort of back in yeah. March or February. No, no comment on no that. No comment on that. All but right. uh, probably interesting to people in Wales is the fact that the treasurer of the Rugby Football Union and the president in the centenary next year, Bill Ramsey, I mean, your connection with Wales is extremely 
close. A close one. My, my wife and all her family come from Newquay in Cardiganshire. And I was very interested because I've just met two other Cardi ladies behind the bar serving drinks, which is not a normal thing in Cardiganshire. <laughs> But, but uh, you know, Cliff, the greatness of the Welsh people is not only their fantastic skill at the game, but their loyalty to the game and their willingness to work for their clubs and for the game. And the, the result of this work is shown here today. It has been hundreds and thousands of people loyally working, not only in England, but in Wales, for the benefit of the London Welsh. And that is an inspiration which rugby should be proud of to have, as it is the feeling of rugby throughout the world. And you today justly are proud of the greatness of this pavilion. Well, this is the ballroom, the tea room, the general purpose room. Uh, and here tonight, more than 350 people have gathered just to see exactly what's going on. And here, on the president's table, the president himself, Harold, uh, I was wondering, at the beginning of this project, were you all confident you could get the money? Well, first of all, our target was a little lower to start with. And second of all, I personally, once I saw the team with which we were working, by that I mean the committee responsible for it, uh, the more time went on, uh, the more confidence I had that we'd raise this sum. And uh, indeed, the appeal is not yet finished. We've got a way to go, but I'm not worried about it at all. We shall get there, and get there very quickly. You look, you look, you look not only hot tonight, but you must feel very proud. I am a very, very proud. I'm proud not only of today, but today epitomizes the magnificent team spirit that exists in this club. And this is a tribute to that team. And to That's someone superb. like Johnny Price, too, because... Well, uh, Johnny Price, of all people. Yeah. I'm going to talk to him now, Harold, if it's with the president. Yeah. Indeed. Great. But Johnny, um, this room and this club has probably better facilities than any other club in probably in the country. Well, we think so, Cliff, and we hope it is so, of course. Yeah. We've tried to establish that through all our labours in the last three or four years and think we think we've achieved it. Oh, the kitchen to give us all tea? Uh, the kitchen, one of the biggest kitchens that any clubhouse has got, I should think, certainly in this country, uh -huh. as far as rugby clubs are concerned. Yeah. And it has to be so, of course, to uh, accommodate the vast numbers of people we get here every week. Uh, just like the bar, of course, the enormous just bar. The enormous right. bar, which is... Uh, again accommodates a very large number of people and is entirely staffed by voluntary helpers and uh, probably again we have a bigger turnover than any rugby club in the country on that sure. side but on a bigger turnover of players because facilities for them you've been keen on too haven't you oh indeed uh, in fact this is where the appeal started we wanted to modernize the uh, play uh, the changing facilities for the players and the appeal commenced there and it was only then realizing that it would be ridiculous to merely alter these facilities as far as the players were concerned that led us on to this bigger concept of a whole pavilion but in doing that we've been conscious all the time of providing the best changing facilities for the players mm. and better than any other team in the country any other rugby club in the country and are you pretty satisfied with what's happened today i'm terribly satisfied yeah. with, indeed yes uh, very satisfied indeed with the outcome of these many years of hard work. And your wife here will be delighted to see you home a, li uh, a little now, Johnny, after I, all this I time. I think she will. We're glad to get him home for a bit, indeed, Mrs. Bryce, won't you? Yes. Yeah. Can I lean across the table to talk with the chairman, David Watts? Um, of course, London Welsh are playing, as it were, on borrowed pastures because this ground doesn't exactly belong to London Welsh. No, and it was a great opportunity when we uh, got the chance to join with the cricket club to share this ground. At Herne Hill, we could do nothing. And here we've had the opportunity, and I think through really hard work, we've, really, we've achieved what we wanted to do. And of course, uh, Tom Outhwaite of the Cricket Club, the president of the Richmond Cricket Club, Tom. And uh, how, do you, how do you feel uh, being surrounded by the Welsh, as it were? Oh, we're quite used to it. Yeah. Uh, we've, we, the last lot of Welsh we had here were about uh, 1480, 1500. Yeah. Henry Tudor, he was a Welshman, and Henry VII, and he lived here. And the place was full of Welshmen then, barging in the line out, pulling each other's jerseys and all the usual stuff. Yes. And then before that we had a whole lot more Welshmen, uh, just at Brentford over the river there, you know. There's a tremendous great ford, and the ancient Britons defended that, not very well. <laughs> uh, that was the first time the Welsh came, uh, Julius Caesar's lot that was yes. against. Yes. But they let them through, I'm sorry to say, and the legionaries 
trampled all over the wicket. You have a special That's loyal toast, of course, in this part yes, of the world, don't you? Yes, the, it's uh, Crown property, and it has been since the days of Alfred. And our loyal toast is our Queen and Landlady. Uh, I told her son that this afternoon. <laughs> well, London yes, Welsh must be delighted as well as you are on this well, I hope extremely so. proud occasion, Tom, and yes, thank you very I much hope indeed. So. They've done marvellously, marvellously. Great. And a quick whip across the table to Dick Ellis. Chairman of the Selectors, Dick, since what? Uh, well, the war, the end of the war. Pretty well, yes, I think that's fair enough. What's been the biggest problem as chairman of uh, Selectors of a London Welsh side? Well, the biggest problem has been finding the players. They come to London. They're unknown, you've got to forage them out, you've got to find that they're coming up, and uh, they're a little bit elusive in this vague city here. And now, of course, we're hoping this place will know where we are, and they'll come to me. I'm hoping that this is the bonanza now, they'll come to me. What's the most difficult position to fill, say, in a London Welsh rugby club? Oh, of course, the second row. I spent my life looking for second row forwards. These big lumps. Well, of course, uh, and I still am always doing this. Now, in the past, uh, the best joke I know on this one is I had a wonderful letter, well typewritten from a chap, said, Dear Mr. Ellis, I'd like to join the London Welsh. I am uh, 22 years of age. I weigh 17 stone, 6 foot 5, and do 100 yards in 11 seconds. And my position is scrum half, with which I burst out <laughs> laughing. This, of course, was a leg pull. My wife had typed it, knowing what my life's work was. And in her ignorance, she said, scrum half. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Mrs. Ellis. It was a great one, yeah, and um, yes, Lee Price Davis across the far side, and you must be very proud because uh, you, you were on the appeals committee at the start. Oh yes I was, and it's been a great day today because it's seen the end of a very worthwhile effort. We hope it goes very, very well for you indeed. And Percy alongside me. Uh, running around a bit this morning, Percy, at the well, beginning. just a little, to make sure that the organisation was ticking yeah. over, and I think it has. Yeah. <laughs> and it's been a worthwhile effort, and we're all very happy today. And I was saying that many great players came from London Welsh in the days, the glorious days of Welsh rugby, and I'd love to go and meet, meet Harry, Ron, yeah, Harry Bogle oh, and Ronnie Boone. And Ronnie is at the top of the table, like the, yeah, opposite the president, Ronnie. Yes. Yeah. Um, a very great moment for the London Welsh Rugby Club. Oh, indeed. Perhaps the greatest. There's been great London Welsh sides, but we are, as Vivian said in, recently, in a golden age. And it is quite remarkable. I mean, today, if, you, if anyone's been here today, one's been moved almost between tears and laughter. In the sense, great joy, but a real Welsh emotion coming through. It's been quite wonderful. We all remember, of course, Ronnie, your great moment at Twickenham when uh, you scored all the points for the Welsh team against the English. Seven points. The drop yes. goal was four points in those days. Yes, it was. Do you remember anything at all about the try you scored that day? Yes, I, I remember it quite well. It was so darned easy. When Watkin Thomas led the Welsh side onto the field at Twickenham in 1933, it was the ninth occasion that the teams had met at the ground. Wales had been unable to beat England in the previous eight matches. In the Welsh team that day, Viv Jenkins, Wilfred Wooler, Claude Davy and Ronnie Boone on the right wing. At halfback, Harry Bocott and Maurice Turnbull. The battle up front produced several scoring opportunities for both sets of backs, with England scoring three points from a try and Wales scoring seven points, a drop goal and a try by Ronnie Boone, who touched down behind the posts. But the drop goal was, was an absolute laugh because Vivian, who was sitting next to me, was behind me. And uh, I had this ball, and I'm quite sure if I'd passed out to Vivian, who had a wing outside, and we'd have scored. But I saw these Twickenham posts looming over me, and it seemed quite the obvious thing to do, and I think I did it. It was Vivian. It was your first cap, Vivian, wasn't it? That day? If he hadn't dropped the goal, he'd have been shot. <laughs> tell you that. Viv, uh, of, all your, of all your memories in rugby, what's the thing you remember most about your days with London Welsh? Well, you know, the spirit of the London... I, we played at Herne Hill, you know, where we uh, had to have water wings and, uh, <laughs> and we, uh, we had about one jersey between us, you know. Yeah. And I always... Uh, I think the spirit of the club is what I like best and I think one, one thing it is... is uh, and Irene Jenkins was our secretary in those days. He's here today. He's 82 years of age. Wonderful. The thing I always remember is going on tour and at Christmas and playing three matches in a very muddy game at Llanelli on the Boxing Day. The following day we had to play Swansea and an Irene Jenkins staying up all night in the kitchen of the hotel washing the jerseys and ironing them to go on the field the following day. And that was the spirit and of course you can see it the spirit has reflected. reached its culmination today. Yesterday. Greatest day in the club's And a great day for the ladies who are allowed to be brought out. Sue? 
Hello. You miss, miss Viv so much. It's nice to have him for a day, isn't it? Well, it's a great change. Yes, yeah, a great treat. <laughs> and of course, uh, not only the president and his table and the distinguished people in this club tonight, but the people who work in the kitchens, the girls, the ladies who come and make tea and sandwiches every day, they, like everyone else, have been delighted, particularly with the sort of rugby football that London Welsh have played in the last couple of seasons. And Mervyn Davis came away. And he's still on his feet and giving the ball out well. A man over there. Nicholas for Ever Ever. John Davis, Yorath, Raybould, and this is Shanklin. Shanklin. And Shanklin has scored under the post. One minute of injury time. London Wolves lead 8 0 in their own 25. And I say time pass. Raybould's dodging run as the doors outside him. Two men free. Andy Morgan. Andy Morgan. 17 tries. Number 18 coming up. Andrew Morgan for the London Welsh. A very fine try. And London Welsh ball just inside the upper 11 25. Well, they open up. They've got the extra man. James is ready in the line. This, that was James. Return pass. The top doors is caught. Yorath did well to anticipate and go back. Says John Davis Little inside half. Inside pass Andy Morgan. And an interception. Sooner or later it will break down. Another interception. Counter interception by John Taylor. John Taylor on his own. John Taylor. And John Taylor there. A magnificent solo effort. Sort of rugby London Welsh try to propagate is one where the ball is always the major thing and people are always looking for support and there's nothing more frustrating as a back row forward if you've done a lot of work to get to the ball and somebody never looks for you and you never get the ball well at London Welsh we tend to get the ball and therefore we're very happy here I think Tony will back this up yeah, with I'll talk with you in a second about that Tony because uh, I was thinking particularly of the combination when John John you turn around John it's your profile isn't as good as the front <laughs> yeah. but John Williams uh, well, that magnificent uh, day the triple crown match in Cardiff well, uh, John was up there very quickly. Four minutes of the match to go, plus injury time. Wales 16, Ireland 6. Again, beautiful service to Edwards. Barry John, they miss out Davis to Jarrett. This is Williams, the fullback. Now he's got, oh, 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 what a dummy. He's got Stuart Watkins. This is Watkins. Can he make it for his second try? Tackled by Gibson, having come inside Duggan. Five yards short of the line. And it's a try for Taylor. John Taylor has scored for Wales. A magnificent bit of support work. This is, this is the great thing about, um, especially from my position, I, I can afford to go... Uh, and even if I'm I can afford to go for a gap, even if I'm tackled, I know that the back row is going to be there to get the secondary possession. Yeah. And this is all important. <laughs> Tony, um, John was saying that you'll bear out everything he said, but uh, you are physical fitness fanatics in the back row of the London Welsh. Try to be. <laughs> Try to be. <laughs> Is it important to you that you have a fluid game, the sort of rugby that London Welsh try to play? To me personally, yes, it has to be. Um, obviously, I'm not physically endowed with a, you know, a 15 stone like some of these um, New Zealand, South African boys. Yeah. And therefore, the movement of the ball is all important. But then when you were thrown into the centre in the Flatley match, it didn't seem to affect you very much. Fortunately, I played in the centre when I was at school and uh, played in the three-quarter line when I was at college. So, um, it helps. Yeah. Just about 10 yards, a good kick there. <laughs> Almost on the 10 yard line. The wheel. 
London Wells trying to take it through. Nessie breaking. Good ball. John kick charged down and picked up, and this could well be a try by Tony Gray. He's got 25 yards to go, and what great acceleration! Of course, you should, one should talk to everybody in the London World side, but everyone will tell you that you have to see the boss, the captain, John Dawes. John, this is a pro day for you. Very much so, yes. I think it's something we've worked for for quite a long time. And it's good to see it going off so well. Everybody here seems to be enjoying it with the singing going on in the background. Oh, I just think so. It's, yeah. it's a, a Saturday night plus, really. When we have a Welsh club down here, things are excellent on a Saturday, but this is something better. A bit more hoyle here. Yeah. And this is what the club's been about, John, let's be perfectly frank. It's hoyle plus the discipline that you impose. I think so, yes. I wouldn't necessarily say Hoyle on the rugby field. I would, well, yes, I would. Hoyle on the rugby field plays a big part. But I would say it's Welsh flair on the rugby field, coupled with football ability. I think this has been the story of our success. Plus hard work, of course, on the part of individuals. You must be probably the proudest captain in rugby in Britain at the moment to have all this surrounding a team of young enthusiastic players. And if you had asked me that about a fortnight ago before Bridget and Hanesh, I'd probably agreed with you. <laughs> yeah. But since then, I'm not so sure. But greatness is about being good in adversity, surely, John? Perhaps, yes. Uh, the game in Wales especially is often geared to results. You tend to be judged by results. I feel that we can achieve the results playing our type of game. We've, we've had a bad patch the last two games, but I feel that the next couple of games we can sort out our difficulties. We've got the players who will know what deficiencies are in the team and how to iron them out in the training field, in the game itself. And I'm quite confident it'll come right in the end. Joe, we'll just give you one moment of pleasure now when we take a look at how, in fact, you got a great try in Stade Coulomb in Paris. The chance for Wales. Beat up by the French hooker Cabanier. Now surely Wales can get off the ground with three points from this. Now they're going to run with it. And in fact, getting in a little kick for Watkins. Oh, what a good catch by the French left wing. But they've got a chance here. James Gores gets over. We couldn't end this program about London Welsh in a more significant way than to listen to music and to see one of the young crop, John Dawes, scoring a great try. William Morris once said that what he understood by great art was a man's pleasure in labour. Why not come to London Welsh and take a look around?